Maritime affairs have always really been about trade, and particularly the roles of navies. Um, historically, we have protected trade, and on odd occasions, we've been distracted by thinking that the main objective is the enemy fleet, but that's only really the immediate objective, and the longer objective is still the preservation of trade and movement, free movement across the seas of the world. And that today is becoming more and more important as, uh, as trade increases, as trade concentrates, and particularly as different countries get into this business and begin to have their own effects on how trade moves around the world. It's significant that one third of our GDP is based on maritime related industry and trade, and uh, ever more importantly for us, that's across the Pacific, as this slide shows. Um, those of you that have an interest in the container trade, uh, this slide itself will be uh, no great surprise to you, uh, but I would just point out the increasing pace of maritime trade around the world, largely containerized, uh, although bulk uh, traffic uh, still accounts for a very large percentage of that, but also uh, the increasing shift as, as uh, far as it uh, concerns Canada of uh, trade across the Pacific. I understand that 37% uh, of BC's exports now go across the Pacific to Asia Pacific uh, and Indo-Pacific nations, and uh, that's up substantially with a corresponding decrease in the number of exports to the states. And Canada itself is uh, second most reliant, second most uh, reliant country on trade among the world. And the bar graphs down at the bottom left here, um, not really visible on this slide, but the green one is, is Germany. After that, it's Canada, Italy, France, and the UK. Slide on the right-hand side, I'd like to point out is is a graph of the. Um, of the rates of growth and decay of, uh, of navies across the world. It's not showing all of them, but it's showing a representative uh, a sampling here from uh, uh, China, United States, Russia, France, uh, Britain, and um, India. can't read the last one. India. 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 <laughs> um, the interesting thing here is that there's a steady downward trend in most of these, and the ones one sterling um, exception to that is the red line here, uh, which is China. Okay, so China has finally woken up to the value of maritime power. Uh, they're modernizing their fleet at a very great rate. And um, they're getting set uh, to claim uh, ever-increasing control over their uh, ocean areas uh, beyond what most of us recognize as their due under the uh, UNCLOS uh, United Convention Law of the Sea. You will see, however, that there's been a stunning decline in the Russian Navy over this period of uh, uh, some uh, 40 years, particularly at the end of the Cold War. And although NATO navies, uh, US and, and others, have declined significantly, this is, uh, uh, this is the United States here, the light blue line, significantly down from their, uh, um, their one-time aspiration for a 600-ship Navy. But that's a trend that has been mirrored by um, all of their allies as well. Uh, NATO nations, etc. Now we're not showing all of the nations in the Indo-Pacific area, but I would tell you that if you put um, Japan and Korea and uh, Southeast Asian nations up there, some of them who are building navies of fairly small platforms, but very, very potent platforms in terms of uh, missile corvettes um, and uh, diesel electric submarines. That's not to say that all of that uh, poses a direct and imminent threat uh, to, uh, to Western interests and trade through the Straits of Malacca, but it could potentially, but more importantly, it just illustrates that a lot of people around the world are waking up to the value of maritime power. They're sorting themselves out and they're providing for themselves in a way that they can get their due in terms of uh, national attention. So how do we get there in terms of uh, preserving that capability and keeping the Navy fit for purpose? Um, this is a slide that kind of illustrates the, uh, the notional migration of our present fleet on the left-hand side to the future fleet on the right. Um, as you know, we have four submarines, uh, two, of them, two of them in uh, uh, refit in uh, the west coast here, uh, Shikunami, which was damaged by fire in 2005 under repatriation from Britain. Uh, she's in the hands of Washington Marine Group and uh, will uh, is shortly to enter the extended docking work period. Uh, Victoria is uh, close to coming out of her extended docking work period. We'll have her operational by next summer. The uh, destroyers, a class of three of uh, originally four. Um, these ships, which were brand new and uh, termed the Sisters of the Space Age when I joined the Navy, 
are now coming on 40 years old. Uh, they're overdue, really, for replacement, but that'll take place in due course. On the minor ships, uh, we have 12 of these um, mine and coastal defense vessels. Recently received in uh, Victoria uh, eight patrol boats called Orcas, um, a significant advance in the small ships that we're using for basic navigational training. Um, rather than having an 80 foot, 80 ton, uh, 10 knots at best diesel powered ship, we've got something that is 110 ton, 110 feet, 200 tons, and we'll do 22 knots with 22 trainees on board. So it's really a step up into the modern era of uh, an integrated electronic bridge, no paper charts, it's all done on uh, electronic charting and display systems. So that will prepare our junior officers to come on board these modernized frigates and destroyers and be perfectly suited for the bridge duties that they'll hold there. The other project that's falling in a similar time frame as the uh, Joint Support Ship, of course, is the Arctic Offshore Patrol Ship. Uh, we're going to build six to eight of these things to give the Navy a capability of operating in the ice in the Arctic. Um, and we do uh, Arctic patrols on a regular basis now. Every year we have Bob Nanook. But the frigates that we send to do that and the MCDVs do not have the capability of going into the ice uh, except at uh, very great risk. So the Arctic Offshore Patrol Ship will give us a capability of uh, moving continuously through up to a meter of ice, uh, having 120 day self-sustainability so that they can visit communities, supplement the activities of the Coast Guard in the north, but begin to give the Navy a, uh, a full season uh, capability in the Arctic to exercise that maritime surveillance and national security tasks. Um, the whole idea of the National Shipbuilding Procurement Strategy is to facilitate the award of contracts and maintain a viable shipbuilding industry in Canada so you don't have destructive competition between entities and some win and the losers go out of business until you know the next 15 or 20 year cycle where they can um, notionally stand up and, and, uh, and bid for this, the, uh, the contracts that are few and far between. So the idea is we would identify two yards to do major contracts of uh, ship contracts of a thousand tons or more. One of the yards would specialize in combat ships, the other yard would specialize in major non-combat ships. For both the Navy and the Coast Guard and any federal fleets in fact that they're building ships of similar size. In this way we can spread out the contracts we can enter into a multi-year contract to, uh, of, uh, of, um, of shipbuilding that will see contract after contracts flowing to these two yards so that they don't have to endure a boom and bust cycle like we saw with um, St. John Dry Dock and Shipbuilding which built our frigates. That will be 28 ships uh, over 30 years for a total cost in the order now of about $33 billion. Uh, a lot of work. Um, and I just focused on the two major yards. Um, that uh, examination and competition to qualify as one of those two major yards will unfold over the next two years. And that will put it into place such that the National Shipbuilding Procurement Strategy will come together with the selection of the JSS design in about two years to go forward. But related to that is a lot of ancillary work for smaller yards. Uh, the ships under 1,000 tons will be spread out to other qualified yards. There's a lot of subcontracting that can happen between the major yards and all their suppliers and uh, supporting industries from coast to coast. The regional economic impacts, of course, in this province, um, CFB is Squimalt in Victoria, is the center of gravity for the military now that we don't have any regular force army here in the province of BC. Um, so we have um, about 30, between 3,800 and 4,000 military folks and about 2,000 civilian employees. Um, in this Weimalt. Uh, but the total economic uh, impact of uh, basis Weimalt and the Navy uh, in the Victoria area is in the order of uh, $700 million a year. Um, about $344 million of that is salaries. Um, the rest is um, in contracts with uh, local industries and, and, uh, and uh, suppliers and, and that sort of thing. Um, but if you add and you look on the broader scale of British Columbia, uh, between contracts that come from uh, headquarters to industries here in Vancouver, um, the activities of the, uh, the Navy and the Army Reserve throughout BC and, and uh, the Air Force in Comox, and add to it the influence and activities of the 8,000 cadets that we have spread across the province and uh, all of their supporters, the total economic impact or, uh, in the BC 
you see, a total is just over a billion dollars a year.